All right, everybody, welcome back. That Witcher episode was definitely a lot of fun. We definitely went into a lot of things in that looking forward and looking back. And um, definitely yeah, want to look much. back towards a great game that, you know, was in a lot of the childhoods. Let's say more like teenage years for a lot of us, um, born in the 90s. And that's Bioshock. Uh, we're definitely going to have a lot of fun with this episode because this was a game that had a unique experience when it came to sitting down playing yep. it for the first time. What do you guys remember about that first play through a Bioshock? Well, I remember this was one of the first, uh, like, you know, first games that I got that I played on my 360 when I got it. Because I got the 360 a bit later than most. But 2007 was my year. Um, so when I, so when this game came out, I remember my older brother got it originally. I remember my mom bought it for my older brother. And she was distinctly like, you cannot play this. You are too young. And then, of course, I played it anyway. Um, but you know, and, and it was, I just, I just remembered it was, it was just such a, it was such an amazing game. There was so much hype behind it. It was so popular and everything. What was you the know? cover picture for that game? Wasn't it the big it was, daddy? Yeah. The, the big drill? daddy. Yeah. Yep. The that's daddy, like yep. the, the iconic. Yeah, definitely. My parent, my parents would have been like, yo, bro, chill. Like, what are you doing? You're not playing this. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, run up somewhere with like drills and shit. No. You know, I remember, I remember distinctly like, you know, at GameStop, they used to like read, you know, read out the back to your parents, be like rated M for like, you know, bloody violence and like you know yeah just, gore just, and, yeah. and sexual themes and all that yeah they were just you sure you want to buy this yeah exactly and i remember like my mom <laughs> looking at like my brother and being like well i guess you know he wants it so but but you know what forget that dude at the game store because there was always a guy like that who would take solace and like ruining little kids days by making the parents aware of like what's actually in the game to be like yeah bro not you you wouldn't want to get this for your son no of course i'm, I'm just saying it's like those, those it's are the too distinct... fun for kids I know. I'm just saying those are like the distinct memories I have, you know, yeah. of like the, 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 this game brings up because, you know, there was it's a very impressionable game. I feel like one of, of me when I was however old I was, like 13 or whatever, when yeah. uh, playing that, you know, and it was very, I mean, very amazing unique experience. experience. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Nothing, very nothing. Unique. I haven't played anything like it before. You know, it's my first probably real experience in, in like mm -hmm. the the horror esque, you know, realm of games. So, so back to Bioshock. We're going to jump straight to the beginning of this masterpiece of a game um, that really just shocked a lot of people because they would pick it up. And there were, I guess at the time, media was really getting into gaming. So there was an idea of games at the time before they came out, what they were like. Yeah. Um, but definitely across, across the industry, across pretty much anyone who's played it. Um, it surprised them their first playthrough for sure. It was, I, I, it was I think a, just just the opening game. sequence alone, would probably, yeah. you know, blew mm -hmm. most people away because so, you know that kind of was like that opening special. sequence with you know you're just chilling on the plane, not really sure what's going on, just reminiscing. Yeah, the, the going full spin into like you know a catastrophic plane crash in the middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. and then they were washing up on an ominous lighthouse. Which, you know what I mean? by the way, um, they did something very very iconic here. Now during that opening sequence, when you do start crashing, the screen goes black. Mm -hmm. right you hear everything in the background you hear the plane going down you hear the screams you hear the plane hit the water and just the water surging right and as the water starts surging and you hear that kind of waterfall sound that really dreadful sound of what it would be like to be in a cabin of a plane that's sinking the title slowly bleeds in <laughs> yeah. and it just and it keeps the sound and it's got the, the airplane still with the engine going and it just slowly bleeds in and it just sets the tone right from the beginning for what exactly. this game is it's just like it's it's eerie it's psychological and it's unknown exactly. so it's very great and then obviously you land in the water you got all the flames around you right you swim up to the surface and, and for the time, those graphics were, like, really, really good, oh, too. the reflections like, in the water were yeah, unheard of. I had exactly. never, at that time, I hadn't seen a game really look that good. In that initial opening part, when you're above the water, the plane's in the distance, not too far, but sinking slowly. Yeah. And the fire's on top of the water, so there's this gas that stays at the top, which happens in water. And then <laughs> these little fires, like, it was just so brilliant to do that. And then you got this lighthouse. Hey, you're just like, what the hell is a lighthouse that is, it's an island. It's a little tiny island. There's no one living there. It's just like, okay, there's a lighthouse here. Now, you could look at it, maybe it's like an iceberg kind of thing where they just put that, that lighthouse there to protect the ships from hitting that rock. Um, but it's, it just made no sense. It was in the middle of nowhere. Um, and there were no boats or anything around. It was just darkness, the plane, the lighthouse. 
And what do you guys remember about going inside that lighthouse? Because that initial entry is also iconic. I remember it being, you know, creepy as hell, obviously, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I mean, I just, it's, you know, it's, it's pitch black. You know, you're trying to find your way. And you, you, everything is all, like, so old. I mean, yes, the, the game is set in 1960s. But everything mm -hmm. you encounter was built in the 1940s, you know, back when, uh, what's right. his face, Andrew Ryan, you know, uh, Began, began his concept for, yeah, for Rapture. Yeah, exactly. So, like, you know, every, even then, like, everything is just so, like, rust, like old and, like, rusty and, like, creepy and, like, worn down. People has no one touched it in forever, you know? It's just very, like... It's really got that real underwater submarine feel to it, very congested and tight Exactly. Spaces. Like, it, it feels... It feels like it's of, like, futuresque, but also, like, old-timey, you know, yeah. in a weird, in a mm -hmm. weird way, which is, like, I feel like very fitting for, like, the rest of the game anyway, too, you right. know? So if you guys remember correctly, um, you go into that, you go into that lighthouse, right? You go inside. Mm -hmm. As soon as you step in, the door closes behind you, right? Yeah. Um, a few games have done this. It's in Resident Evil 7. As soon as you enter the house, um, the door closes behind you, <laughs> right? And it just lets you know, like, <laughs> there's that's the point of no return, right? Yeah, that's exactly. the real world. That's the good world. That's you're safe. in for the ride now. Buckle up. Now you're here, right? You're buckled in the ride. You know, the ride's going up and there's no escape, right? Um, very, very iconic moment when you first enter there. But then the lights turn on, right? And you're you're greeted by this huge statue, I believe, of of, of Andrew Ryan, or I, mm -hmm. believe, well, I believe that's the creator of Rapture. And you're just like, wow, okay, so this guy is obviously worshipped or he seeks worship in this area. You don't know where you are yet. He's got but a big ego. A, I believe there's like a, is there like a pod? That you enter that goes down yeah the, water, it, right? the exact name what is it it's called a it, it's called a, a bathysphere that's like a, you know it's one of those like you know those types of like uh insanely sphere. cool man i yeah, swear it's, like, it's those spherical like deep sea uh you know submersible mm -hmm. underwater like you know right type of like cable car type things like um, what they'll use nowadays they'll send it they're usually unmanned i think there are some that are manned but yeah they, you know they can't go so yeah, deep. No, those things are freaky it's a no for me bro yeah, yeah it's a no for me. They're, they're so tight too they're like oh now this pod was actually kind of spacious for one person you know it's really good it had a nice mm -hmm. view too <laughs> but um in in real life these these little submarines they're so congested and so tight because the pressure at deep levels it, it would literally crush anything that's just any bigger and if there were any windows any bigger too the windows are super small in those submersibles yeah. um the water would just crack through the glass so right. this little bathysphere that Brendan was talking about is really cool because you go into it and it closes and it immediately goes in the water and it takes you on the most desensitizing, like just, it, it really just relaxes you, right? It hmm. makes you not even think that you're in a game that's about horror or something creepy is about to happen. It takes you on a little tour through Rapture with a speech that's kind of creepy. It's a little that eerie. That was awesome, man. Yeah, no, it was. It was, definitely. Yeah, no, I wouldn't use calming as, a, as the word <laughs> because <laughs> underwater is scary, bro. I don't care what anybody says mm -hmm. to go any type of feet under there. Yeah. Nah, it, it's I guess for, for some me, people, but, but for me, it's like, it was just cool because when they first, that, that first section, when they introduces you to Rapture and it kind of just opens itself up and you see Rapture is just this huge underwater city in front of you with neon lights and and mm -hmm. passageways between buildings and you know obviously fish everywhere it's it's a marvel to look at it really was something that when you saw it you're like wow this is unique i've never seen anything like this before yeah. i think it's like the first game glad. that was like the first game to do that too like have a whole underwater city like this i never extent, really i don't you know? i don't i think the only game now one thing that i did remember a ton of playing bioshock what it reminded me of it reminded me of the first Jack and Daxter game. Do you remember in the first Jack and Daxter game, there was that, that second area that had the underwater precursor city that you would go to? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. And it had that same aura. It was this huge underwater precursor city that had passageways and like these little sliding sections that you would go through. Just really unique kind of area that you wouldn't really, really wouldn't expect that you also travel to by elevator. Mm -hmm. Really reminded me of Bioshock in a way. Um, with that, with how they 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 approach this underwater section, but again, it's unique. It's yeah. it was never done before in that breadth with a full game underwater. 
Now, I remember, I love, personally, love the scene once the, once the bathysphere actually, like, arrives down, you know, brings you into the terminal in Rapture. Oh, and, yeah. you know, that opening scene, once you stop down there and, like, you know, you you encounter that first splicer. You don't, you, you see the silhouette at first and it kind of just creeps mm-hmm. out. All I remember. in shadow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, All exactly. All in shadow. And it, and it just comes and, you know, eventually it's just, try, it, it reminds me kind of like the necromorphs trying to break into the elevator in Dead Space when they're trying to, like, yep, break into Very similar. It. Yeah, exactly. Trying to, like, mm-hmm. break into the bathysphere to, like, get out of there was that time when it like kind of disappears out of view which yeah. is when their doors closed in dead space but then it blasts through right and then he shows up after a little bit too right on the glass so exactly and that's when you know you encounter your good buddy your good buddy atlas you know comes on the radio yes. and starts trying to communicate yes. to you your guy i love that irish accent this beautiful too world. yeah this beautiful t- sick twisted world it's everything Adam, Adam so Ryan dope had. <laughs> he teaches yeah he really he really holds your hands you know through rapture explains to you the whole honestly that's you know. it's and it's not even overdone it's not even a cheap mechanic it's not even something that they just had to oh put yeah well, he, it, you need it you yeah, no exactly. one knows right. where they are or what to do so, exactly yeah. mm-hmm. and it explains the history of of the plasmids you know they basically like you know for spoiler warning i suppose we should have said in the beginning if you haven't played this not game a game before. not not for a game that's from 2000 <laughs> yeah. What, yeah yeah I know, I know. 2007. <laughs> yeah no exactly. not happening but like spoilers I guess... are not a problem there's a 10 year <laughs> limit of statutes on that okay fair, fair enough uh but you know since since they were i guess a segregated or not segregated but you know like it, they were sectioned off from the rest of society apparently mm-hmm. you know they said that like you know medicine and arts and science all like you know advanced like a ton and they produced uh there's this stuff called atom which was like some gene altering substance which was uh developed from some species of sea slug they found on the ocean floor which they used to make the plasmids which were no you know were like the mutagenic uh serums which yeah. they would inject adjust themselves your with. dna to take yeah, advantage of exactly. some superpowers and it would give you powers like the telekinesis pyrokinesis you know the the one with the bugs uh, you know all the electric plasmids. yeah, yeah electric and like uh eventually it was like addictive though and it drove people insane over time so mm-hmm. kind of like you know and also the, the war the, the you know there was a kind of like a, a political quote-unquote war between andrew ryan and, and frank fontaine who are like you know the two big uh, honchos down there even though andrew ryan founded the rapture frank fontaine right. was another big businessman who was like heavily influential and um there was some big war between them and uh you know frank uh, you know, we'll, we'll get more into that later with like the big twist and whatnot. But you know, Frank quote, yeah. quote died, and you know there was a, like a big, there's like a, there's a big war that kind of led to like society collapsing. Mm-hmm. Um, it was Russia. definitely, it's definitely, it definitely concurred with the atmosphere that they were putting right. So the atmosphere is obviously 40s around there. Um, yeah, because early, early 1900s, right? The early, the early yeah, it was early 1940s. 1950. Yeah, well, the game takes place in 1960, but yeah, everything was built yeah. in. It's got, it's got, 40s. it's got that feel of that that middle era of the 1900s, right, where mm-hmm. exploration was a thing and underwater exploration it was all about those big bulky suits yeah. that you would get in with a huge, huge head on it. Yeah, the one um, from SpongeBob. Yeah, or yeah, they, I remember that episode. Yeah, that that awesome episode. <laughs> 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 I remember that one. Um. But yeah, it was definitely going with that atmosphere in terms of everything was like chaotic at the time, right? They had just finished the two world wars a couple decades before, and it was still fresh in a lot of people's minds. Um, there was definitely this sort of explosion of technology and um, convenience, right? And a lot of money to grab. So yeah. there was there was definitely that feel of corruption in Rapture, um, even though it looked beautiful on the outside. Uh, it's one of those things that you pull the curtain back a little bit and you look behind. And the inside of Rapture was very, very ugly, and it was hmm. very dark, and um, it was something that it didn't it didn't make sense how someone could think it could last a long time, right? Um, sectioning off these people on the water, it just it would definitely lead to problems. The mm-hmm. atom didn't help, as you said, it's yeah. very symbolic of like what an opioid epidem- exactly. epidemic is, um, because they would be injecting themselves with it, and like Brendan was saying, they wouldn't be able to shake the addiction, and yeah. it would drive them to madness which is very reminiscent of like the 80s, 70s, right? Um, And even today, right? We have the opioid epidemic still happening, raging on today. And um, it took a lot of themes from life and it put them in this very dark atmosphere underground. So when you first start exploring Rapture um, with with Atlas guiding you, every room has got this, this beautiful aesthetic that just really immerses you in everything that's going on. There's the water seeping through in certain sections, right? You got to like change yeah. water levels to get through rooms. 
um, there are like numerous strollers. I don't know why, but in the beginning, yeah, there. Do you right. remember that that opening hallway? Well, one one of the opening hallways, where there's like a, a stroller there, and there's a lady by the stroller, but all you see is the shadow. Yeah. So as you approach, you slowly start to notice that she yeah, she's looking in the stroller, but there's nothing in there. I, be, I forgot what it was that was inside, but you could clearly see. I think it was a gun. I think, yeah, yeah, I think, I think you're yeah, right. Yeah, I think it was I a gun. I think it was a gun that she had inside the stroller, and she's just like coddling it like a baby and singing madness to herself. And then she attacks. Mm. You. Yeah, so that's where yeah. we get to combat, right? You really get introduced to combat rather quickly. You pick up a wrench, you start swinging it, and you're like, wow, this thing has weight. And you know, what do you love about the combat? I mean, well, I mean, it was very fluid. It was very dynamic between the mix of the plasmids and the and the weaponry. You know, between the hand to hand combat or the uh, the gunplay. You know, it was all it all was good. Um, even holds up to this day. I would say, you know, it's still even you know across all three games, really, even especially in Infinite. I thought the gun gunplay was done ex- exception. Exception. Won't be surprised well. if they look at a remake um, on that game on Bioshock yeah, One. I did. Oh, eventually, it'll happen. Yeah, Definitely. It, it's if you look at it, it like Brent said, it aged very well. But a remake would just be, be just put that little cherry on top yeah but i mean i mean i just loved i mean the the every everything about the pl- about the the combat was fun but the plasmids especially was what really got me you know the, mm-hmm. every game has guns you know nowadays yeah the, the guns really took a back seat in this game yeah. i would say um they were cool and everything but they weren't as effective it was more like how you inter how you combined it with the other stuff yeah you know I mean? there you go they definitely implemented a good combination system in terms of stunning enemies Right, throwing the electricity at the water yeah. and actually electrocuting people that were standing in the water. And upgrading you know, the plasmids was good too. Right. And certain and enemies needed them. certain, you know, combat types to get taken down. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah. in that beginning section, you really encounter some really weak enemies, but it's perfect because it, you, you can feel the progression of tension as the game goes on. Even before, I'd say, this whole opening section where you're exploring and you're being guided by Atlas, mm-hmm. I'd say it's about an hour and a half, two hours of gameplay in that opening section between explanations from adam ryan where you stop and listen to like little excerpts explaining you know the history um and then gameplay itself it's really like it's about like two hours before you really go to the next section and things ramp up again but that gradual escalation of tension is really helped by the combat that they give you because it wasn't too crazy in the beginning well i was gonna say i really liked the beginning of the game too because i always felt like you can like feel them like leading you towards like you know the bigger enemies that you're going to be coming you're going to be facing later in the game you know the real uh the the real uh existential dread inducing So I got a fun fact for you guys. Did you guys know this? Uh, the concept of of why they of how they came up with Bioshock. Go ahead, shoot. All right. So Bioshock's concept was developed by Irrational's creative lead, Ken Levine. Ken right? Levine, yeah. And uh, basically, he incorporated ideas from by 20th century dystopian and utopian thinkers such as Ayn Rand, George Orwell, Aldous Huxley. George Orwell's fingerprints are all. Yeah, over. and yeah, I knew, yeah. I knew, I knew Atlas Shrugged was a big influence because Anne Rand and Atlas Shrugged was like a huge, huge yep. thing at that time. Yeah. But now we got two, and then you got Aldous Huxley, and then John D. Rockefeller, and mm-hmm. Walt Disney. Yep, the Monopoly kind of the good guy in business, um, but really just in power and just yep. too powerful in a way. And right? Walt Disney. Well, yeah, because yeah, because yeah, he, I think he influenced probably like the figure of. Uh, you know uh, what's his face andrew uh andrew ryan himself was probably heavily influenced by like those sort of like mag business magnates of that era you know makes sense so who do you think rockefeller was supposed to be and who do you think walt disney was supposed to be as far as those two politicians in the game i think they're all like little influences on the overall (laughs) idea of like andrew ryan i could see walt disney being andrew ryan i could see rockefeller being fontaine yeah in my opinion. right more of a businessman right <laughs> yeah so maybe actually if you think about it let's put this in a contrast right um magic 
on the Disney side with the magic of innocence mm -hmm. and children, and on the other side, oil, right? This this substance <laughs> that is also thought of as magic and happiness because it brings money and it's black gold, right? Yeah. Um, and then two men presiding over it in a sort of monopoly, uh, monopolistic state, right? Yeah. He's really he really Walt Disney really had a monopoly on children's animations and things like that with Mickey, Mickey Mouse and all the characters he made at the time. Um, he was really at the at the front forefront of that. And then obviously John D. Rockefeller with the mon monopoly and and oil in the industrial right. era for the U.S. is very very good contrast and similarities there. Um, that all I believe influenced the overall idea of Andrew Ryan. I don't think he was definitely um, just focused on one person. Well, yeah, it's not a one to one. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, it's nowhere near right. one to one. I'm, I'm just saying like you can definitely see the influences. Yeah, I mean? for sure. George Orwell's all over this man. Yeah. You think about that name, you're just like, yeah, this is definitely him. So that's the opening section, right? Mm -hmm. But obviously the hand holding stops at some point. Mm -hmm. And boy, yeah, well, well, once you once you get to that scene uh, where you're climbing up in the rafters, right? The very first time you encounter uh, the big daddy and the little sister, you know that 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 I feel like that scene is right when everything Jesus. starts to change. You know what I mean? When right I here. when I first experienced Bioshock, I did not know really what the game was. Right? I did see the cover with that you know that thing on the front, but I had no idea what that was. I I actually went into that game thinking that was the protagonist. And that you were uh, just, you know, going to go through the world like with this thing. I was not aware of it. I think it was 2007, right? Yeah. 2012, I was not into like gaming news and all that. I wasn't at least capable of getting my hands on that news. Nowadays, if I was 12, yeah, because everyone's got iPhones. But at that time, I did not have a phone yet. So I really just picked up Bioshock because it was like the popular game at the time. And a few of my friends said that they were playing it. And I remember when I first saw the Big Daddy, bro, that changed the whole Hmm. everything i mean the first the first scenes were already kind of tense already but when you met the big daddy it ramped it up to 12 because yep. it's not just introduced lightly it's introduced with this vicious mauling of a human in front of you <laughs> thrown against the glass heavy steps charging at him nothing stopping him it was just one of the one of the most shell shocking scenes ever because i did not expect it. yeah no, 100%. I mean, I was the same way. Like, I just remember, like, it's just so, it's so, like, it's so dread inducing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. As you're, like, hearing, you're hearing or watching the big daddy, like, you know, kill that splicer that was trying to get the little sister. Just knowing that, like, oh, God, I'm going to have to face that thing eventually. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, you don't face it right away, yeah. right there. But, but you know, mm -hmm. like, that's what's coming. Like, that's what's out there. Soon, soon enough. One thing I really loved about it, though, in terms of the overall game from beginning to end mm -hmm. about the big daddies and everything, that initial scene, you're introduced to it. That's the enemy, right? Like they, they're, they're horrible people and they are the enemies throughout, but they're like, that's a monster. You know what I mean? But then you find out what their purpose is within the world of rapture and what they what exactly they do yeah in terms of protecting the little system and yeah because it's actually you actually wind up it's actually there i feel like they're the big daddies aren't actually all that bad because it's really mm -hmm. they're protecting the little sisters and the little sisters are like low-key like abused the manipulative as hell. bees right yeah, yeah mm -hmm. like because they're just they're like sur they're like surgically altered to have like those you know i mentioned before those those like sea slugs or whatever that make that make the atom that they use to make the plasmids right Right. Um, they're, they they like somehow do something with them where they like put them like in their the girl's stomachs and they're able to like mass produce Adam that way um, and like so they and they go around collecting Adam from like dead bodies and stuff you know as I see and like the girls were able to like mass produce like Adam and it's like a whole like messed up thing all while um, stealing the life of the child yeah exactly and so the big daddies are obviously are meant to protect the little a lot sisters. of Mao Zedong um, um, a lot of Mao Zedong influence yeah. in the world as but well. But then, obviously, you know, one of one of the other characters you meet is Dr. Tenenbaum, and she's, like, you know, dead set on helping the little sisters. She teaches you um, how you can, like, you know, she gives you something that pretty much, like, you know, frees the girls of their, you know, stomach slug and, uh, you know, like, pretty much saves their soul, basically. Like, brings them, gives them, brings back, them the back. Right. Yeah, and, you know, you obviously have the choice as to whether to, you know, uh, drain them of their atom or save them you know what i mean <laughs> well you know i like the choice they give you the and, and 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 i've played i've i've played the game multiple times and i've done both ways you know and i've tried both out i mean it's obviously a better ending when you save them obviously but you know right. curiosity obviously can't be helped either um yeah no i'm definitely i don't care how many times i play it i'm not saving them every time no mm -mm. <laughs> nope yeah, yeah, just the up, man. yeah no i don't know i just something about the fact that i, I highly doubt 
how they can return to normal if they're being as manipulative as they've been. Yeah, but you've seen the good um, ending. Yeah, good I've seen ending. the good ending, but, you know, I, I know. tend to like the bad ending better. <laughs> yeah, I think Terrible. It resonates, they're, they're kids, it resonates man. more. It, it feels more realistic in a way. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. But yeah, I mean that that obviously that intro scene with the with the um with the big daddy is sort of like a big smack in the face, right? Because mm -hmm. you just spent the whole section learning plasmids. You're you're frying, you know, these enemies, it's just singular enemies, maybe a group here and there, and you're like, Alright, I got the game. Like, all right, what's next? You know, more enemies, right? You're thinking it's gonna be the uncharted mechanic, and it's always gonna be these little enemies that they send at you. Um, but then, as soon as you get your confidence and you feel good about yourself, they stomp your dreams out and they throw the big daddy out there and let you know what's really out there in this world. And um, yeah, it really gives you a reality check, right? But um, it's it's a fleeting moment, right? Um, you see the big daddy in front of you and then it kind of walks off with the little sister. Yeah. And um, you don't see them again for a while. Right? Yeah, but, but Atlas tells you, Atlas does tell you to kill them and harvest them, you know, but then obviously you see the doctor and she's like, no, don't do that, save them. Yeah, exactly. You know, so you, you got know, like, they, you got like the... It immediately, it immediately tells you um basically like there's another way to do this yeah right? there's another way to go about it which was the premise of the game as you said you can save all the girls or you can let them you know just keep being them those disgusting little things yeah but, exactly um, and so atlas is basically telling you like now basically atlas wants you to go like help him like stop ryan he wants you to like get to him and like help him kill him just really goes to show you that like the width of the mechanics that they put in this game Mm -hmm. For something that was too. the first iteration of the IP, right? Yeah. Very well executed. And they obviously knew what they wanted to do with it. And they had the freedom to do it, you can tell. Um, and it really ended up coming in, in a great package for everyone. Um, but then, you know, you're obviously going through the middle portions of the game. And you've really started to discover that Rapture is not what it seems. Um, there's obviously something really wrong going on in Rapture. And you need to find a way to a not only help out the situation, i.e., the little sisters, um, figuring out what to do with them, but then also finding a way out of Rapture, right? Because at the end of the day, you it's a it's a it's a maze down there, and um, they really treated it that way in terms of a lot of backtracking in certain sections. Um, there was a lot of puzzles that were solved later on in the game, Metroid mm -hmm. style, and you could go back to earlier sections and sort of solve them. What do you remember best about the middle portions and really that climax of the game? Because I know you got something about that. Well, I mean, obviously, like, I mean, I think like, in that middle section, that's like when the whole real big revelation that yeah. we encounter happens, right? When you finally uh, confront Andrew Ryan and he kind of like explains to you the whole truth of, you know, your character's existence which he is peels the curtain back all the way yeah exactly mm -hmm. it gives them this I, I remember i remember the first time i ever played the game like it was just being that's like sitting back being like holy shit it's one of like the biggest like you mm -hmm. know mind-blowing moments in like a game that i've ever ever seen yeah. basically you know you figure out that jack the character that you've been you've been playing as this entire time was adam i mean andrew uh andrew ryan's illegitimate son um basically yep. um and that Got actually yeah, yeah exactly and actually he didn't even he didn't even know that um, he he was he was his son originally because you know it was actually um, he got a woman pregnant you know it was it wasn't his wife he got a woman pregnant and this woman sold the embryo to Frank Fontaine his rival the rival businessman right just and the then, sickness of this exactly entire story. Mm -hmm. and then Dr Tenenbaum the, the person that you met with the sisters actually helped grow and raise the rapidly age the embryo to adulthood and yep. then kind of like brainwashed it which and then sent him to the surface which is like you jack they sent you to the surface waiting for the right moment it just happens they, to shoot your plane out right over the, the exactly because they knew that they would need your dna to access all of like the dna locks and shit to get into like you know finally get to like andrew ryan basically um so and they base and the whole time they've been manip manipulating you with the code word you know would you kindly and mm -hmm. if you look back at all the dialogue all of atlas's phrases you know it's a hypnotic trigger basically Yep, and um, and even and if you, you would look back do to the very said. yeah, and if you look back to the very beginning beginning of the game too, actually, um, you realize that uh, before the plane crashes, that the the words were would you kindly were written on the newspaper that you're reading, and that you know Jack was, you know, responsible more than likely for the plane crash. 
Um, so kind of just like this whole and, and kind also of explains that, why it blacks out there for a yeah, second. Then the all, chaos happens. But, but also the, fi the, fi the, fi the final part, important part of this is that Atlas is actually Frank Fontaine. Frank Fontaine mm -hmm. faked his death and mm -hmm. then presented himself as Atlas so he could like, you know, spur the masses. It's just, it's and, just like, overwhelming. It's just yeah. an overwhelming amount of twists. It didn't stop. It was how long was that scene? Was it like a fifteen minute? Yeah, it was a good scene? like. Yeah, exactly. It was like it a was whole just like an, a short never film. ending flurry <laughs> of mind bending. What oh, and, the f? And, and then and then Andrew Ryan asks you, would you kindly beat him to death with the golf yes, club? And yes. then he <laughs> succeeds. He, he scene. makes you. He makes you beat him to death with the golf club, which it's is just like, like, would you kindly do this? And, I was. I remember sitting there, just like, "What is going on?" Exactly. And then he drops that bomb. He's like, "All right, yeah, would you kindly just beat the shit out?" Give like, him the, the me. give him the Joel treatment. Exactly. Bro. The ground. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. The Joel treatment. <laughs> that's foul, man. <laughs> that's foul. That's foul. <laughs> no, it's too soon. Man. Hurt a lot of people. It's not it's too soon. Lot of how long is how long has the game been? I was nah, not too but soon. But yeah, that's well, insane. <laughs> it's insane how like <laughs> they double M Night Shyamalan you. Yeah. This oh, game, you know. It's like, oh, here's the real story between your, you know, your your background. But now here's the real story for like the whole plot. <laughs> but then, <laughs> now, let's 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 also put a light on this. Um, in terms of the Bioshock franchise, it was notorious for moments like this. Yeah. Right. Those long sections of just you thought you understood this world. Let me flip it over like eight times, and then see if you recognize it. Exactly. It also happened. I remember distinctly because I I haven't played Bioshock Infinite, but I did witness the ending. Um, at the hands of one of our guests that we had, um, we've had on the show a few times, Rocco. I remember yes. he played it in college, um, and he was playing Bioshock Infinite. I remember I walked in on him a few times during the game, and uh, the second time I walked in, it was in a middle section, and it was clearly, <laughs> it was clearly one of the like climax sections because all I saw was Rocco looking at the screen with his jaw to the floor, and he's just like, mm -hmm. and it was just a middle section. But then I had walked out. And I remember that, that one of the last times I walked in on him playing the game, he was at the end. And it was with all the lighthouses and it was the baptism scene, right? And right. it was just like he was, again, with the, the entire... Now, this is a 20-minute cutscene. Drown at me, least. motherfuckers. Like, it's, it's more than that, maybe. Hmm. And this dude is just sitting there. I'm just like, wow, like he's really amazed at this. So I sat there and I just... I had no idea what the game was about yeah. um, in terms of, like, you know, the story of it. I just watched the ending. And it was one of the best endings to... If I would say if that was the ending to that saga, I guess, um, yeah, that seemed like it was very satisfying for whoever played it and played the first two. I mean, that game was a very satisfying ending. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, absolutely. The I mean, infinite uh, its ending was definitely like a bit of like a, a mind fuck, but it was it was really good. It was it yeah. was really really well done. It was very understood. From what I saw, I understood everything that was going on, and I had literally only watched the last section. Yeah, that's why. And it's this climax in Bioshock really it mimics that in terms of well it did it first but it really is the same kind of formula when it comes to um you could tell that you know originating that first bioshock game that it was something that was a, it was a common formula that they were going to use and it really put irrational games on the map in terms of being a great storyteller right um oh, yeah. it really put them in this light where like wow like you know if they can do this who knows what other franchises they take in the future if they ever decide to what they can do with that storytelling right um, so that was really effective when it came to Bioshock and it was one of the reasons why it was even um, considered great to begin with. It started with the story, the narration and the writing. Um, if we were to get a continuation of Bioshock, right? Yeah. What would a future Bioshock game be like? What would you want to see? I, personally, I would want them to just kind of continue the trend of doing like a whole nother like you know not necessarily new universe but you know like whatever like some maybe like a different world set in that same sort of vibe you know because mm -hmm. i mean i don't know like a return to rapture would unless they do it right i feel like it could just be like you know kind of like a a, a baby you know like a a, a nostalgia baby like a dead kind space of. style remake where it's very yeah. true to the source material and does not deviate oh yeah i mean if, if they're gonna do a remake i wouldn't mind like a ground up remake in the in like right. the same vein as like resident evil or the the one dead space is getting i wouldn't mind that but if they're gonna do like a sequel like you know like a, another like a, another bioshock game right i think i would prefer like an original another original an you know, original story within the universe yeah but, but right. you know obviously 
obviously irrational games now uh is no longer yes. irrational games they go by i forget they go by a different name now that i i don't have it in front of me i forget i'll pull what, it up i'll pull it up i forget what it what, what they go Boston. by now oh yeah actually no, no, no. Never mind. that's their old name yeah no it's their old name irrational games ghost story games oh that's what it was i knew it was something yeah. with a g yeah ghost story games is what they go but yeah. they rebranded the ghost story but ken levine is still the leader um of them so you know if they got involved in something you know i think that would be you know uh the direction that they would want to go in right yeah but how what are the chances that this becomes a cd project red type of scenario where um they've made these games for a while right they made the three witcher games then they pivoted and they did cyberpunk but what about what if what would you think if this if um if ghost story games goes in a different route and um just does a completely uh different type of game not first person not 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 um anything rpg like in terms of with the magic and anything but maybe grounded in reality like when sucker punch did a samurai game yeah i mean i, I mean i think i think they could do anything really i mean they've got a good team behind it you know um but you know this actually reminds me we did i think we previously mentioned before we started recording that there there is like some rumblings of a of a bio another another bioshock being developed by 2k um but that is obviously separate from uh what is it you know that's that's not uh, gonna be ghost story or ken levine you know involved yeah. but still 2k um developing it i guess but you know the, so that was in like 2019 i think they said they said they said that they um were developing something um we haven't yeah. heard which anything. i don't know why they can develop and do great on all these other games but you know borderlands and they can't they just can't get 2k right like the nba 2k oh yeah like it's just like come on bro like, just, you're doing <laughs> yeah, great and all this other stuff, but you're blatantly just, you know, where their not, priorities are, I guess. Yeah, I guess, you know, but, but I don't mind it. I don't mind it, you know. No, no, yeah. for, for NBA is always going to be. No, I do mind it. Game. I have a big yeah, problem yeah. with that, but that's for another episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a big problem 2K, with 2K. See what you got to do in 2K. Yeah, you got to yeah, talk yeah, about right. NBA, man. Ronnie, right, you better right, do but, something, bro. But yeah, they're 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 developing something. It seems like, but you know that they hasn't hasn't been much to you know news about it in three years so we'll see what actually happens with them but still you know there's potential for something in the future so right. we'll wait and see mm-hmm. i mean as definitely far as making... definitely excited about a, a completely different type of game right as far as making a completely different type of game though i feel like what settings could they even do now because they did rapture which is underwater right and then mm-hmm. in infinite that was in the sky wasn't it i would love to yeah. see like a maybe a interplanetary kind of thing from them space i feel like it's something on the moon right something yeah, that tackling could be, ooh, that maybe could the, cool. the moon that, landing. Could, that could actually be really cool that could be that could be an atmosphere and an yeah. aesthetic that they would easily be able to envelop in maybe like a city on the moon kind of thing you know uh destiny like on the dark side of the moon right mm-hmm. um yeah. where in destiny like you know you travel the moon they had they ended up putting all these like little civilizations there Obviously, here it would be much more realistic. There could easily be like a crater somewhere with a cave that's not seen from like Earth, and it leads into right. Rapture on the Moon, right? <laughs> so, right. like, I feel like I that's what that's that. what made Bioshock stand out as far as like you know mm-hmm. aesthetic and the way it looks visually. Is mm-hmm. it being in different environments that it's not you don't see that off or at all, mm-hmm. you know? When I when I saw Infinite come out, it gave me real Skyward Sword vibes from Zelda um when when the zelda side skyward sword game came out and it was just basically this kingdom in the skies right um it, and after all the game was always been on the surface it kind of gave me that vibe when infinite came out oh this is like a you know it's a, a, a utopia in the sky right um that's what i really thought about it when when i saw that so the environments have always been well picked and they've been well detailed as well um yeah. and the lighting has always been perfect right for bioshock very dark lighting um, reflective surfaces and then for columbia lots of lighting everywhere mm-hmm. um sun right bouncing up and everything yeah. i i i pretty i'm pretty sure there's ray tracing in that game um i don't know i don't know about you guys Maybe. but that, the lighting is so well done uh that you could pass as some ray tracing which is a very beautiful environment in columbia yeah um but reaching towards the end of bioshock right so this yeah. experience it really takes you on this roller coaster um it puts you in a lot of situations you obviously you face off against the big daddies. You've gotten the combat down. You've got multiple combinations that you could throw. Yeah. You've saved um, or killed the little sisters. Yes, you saved or killed, um, depending on how harvested, I should say. <laughs> invested in the story, you are. Okay, that's my excuse. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. So you reach kind of this moral, 
this moral, uh, I would say, balance at the end where you've made decisions, like you said, on bad things you do or good things you do. And you end up with one of how many endings? Well, there's two endings, but I mean, the first mm-hmm. thing, first, first things first is, you know, you actually eventually you face Fontaine and he, you have to, you have to like fight, you know, Frank Fontaine basically after you find out all that crazy shit that, uh, you know, Ryan told Adam, uh, Andrew Ryan told you. And, uh, you know, he injects himself with like an obscene amount of Adam and like turns into some giant, like, you know, deformed, like monster Arkham Asylum uh, Joker. I was just thing. thinking that. Yep. Yeah, some giant blue skinned human. Takes type all the uh, the venom from Bane. Yeah, but then you wind up getting crazy. helped by you know the little sisters, and they help you kind of drain all the atom from his body, and eventually mm-hmm. you know you, you kill him. But then yeah, and that's when it comes into play whether you, you know, whether you harvested or rescued the little sisters because you know if you if you rescued rescued all of them, then uh, you know they give you the good ending where you're you you it flash forwards to like you like adopt getting out of Rapture and like adopting. Uh, the little sisters and uh, becoming like you know an old man die you know you die like you know surrounded kind of like, like a group of man. in a way yeah like, exactly like older you're person like, with a bunch of these little people around you're just like oh man you're the best dad ever to these things you do you let a good just life. worship <laughs> exactly right? but then like if you harvest all of them then you get like the bad end you know. um but that battle with Fontaine I just remember the synergy of all the moves and mm-hmm. all the abilities that you got at that point all the and it was just a smooth back and forth of doing whatever it is that you felt like you needed to do to get to, to beat him, um, moving, dodging, you know, hitting him at the right, staying away, keeping your distance, and then, you know, getting close when you could um, with the shotgun or whatever gun you would have. Um, and it was just a great, like, you know, great experience in terms of this was the culmination of everything that you got in the game from here, from, from the beginning till now. And then it just throws you into this boss battle, which was, Obviously, once the little sisters came in and, and you know tried to help them, it really changed the dynamic. It was it was great in terms of they told story through the fight. Still, right? You know, there was talking during the fight that was really good and um, really impactful for like finding out what was going on in his head and what his thinking was. So it was just really really great um, execution with that last fight when it came to what um, Irrational Games was able to do, uh, and then really just set you up really for the next game. That's really yeah. what it did. It just set it up for all right. This is the universe, and it was a lot of history was told. Um, there was a lot of you know in, implications going forward from your actions, mm-hmm. and um, really just set it up for what would become a great runner up. Honestly, one of the better runner ups of all time when it comes to sequels. It just did what it was supposed to do, and it executed even more. Um, yeah, I mean, of, Bioshock of, too. Yeah, yeah, Bioshock too. I mean, I mean, of the whole Bioshock series, it's it's ar- arguably the the worst but that's not necessarily a bad yeah. thing you know what i mean <laughs> because like none of that's like you know that's like not really the, the worst thing to be because it's, it's yeah still they're a good all game. great games but um, definitely two is the weakest one yeah but but mm-hmm. but it's because it's very disconnected and also like you know you, you play as uh as uh delta one of like you know the original big daddies from like yeah. 1950s mm-hmm. but like you play as him like in 1968 after the events of the first game when like rapture is like even more like abandoned and you see the big sisters and like you know you're trying to per- you're trying to like reconnect with your little sister i think or something like that and yeah i forget exactly i haven't played the second one as much but it, it was good definitely but definitely not as good i think as the other two it was really just two, like but... more of the same but i feel mm-hmm. like because people had already been through that world but it also um, wasn't developed by an, an irrational game so right it was, it was different, 2K, different visually 2k like moran i think it was 2k moran or something like that moran um, yeah it was yep, moran, moran yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it was Moran. So yeah, definitely, so. definitely was it, it. Didn't do anything wrong. It just, I, I just felt like it didn't push the envelope forward enough to consider itself, you know, um, a true sequel. But the game was a great runner-up to the first game, if that makes sense. Um, it was, it was good enough to stand on its own and be a second game. It's just like you said, the disconnection um, in terms of you know from the other angle being a big daddy, right? That was yeah. the main premise of the game. Now you're a big daddy yourself. Um, that was enough to, you know, to, to make them think, all right, let's do a second game based off of this from the other angle. Um, I think it would have been something that would have been executed a little better if there was two angles within the same game. Mm-hmm. Um, told not in The Last of Us where, where it's one half and then the other half, really just maybe a back and forth in a way. The Halo um, 2 style thing? 
Halo Two style, exactly. Uh, that would that would have been very effective if they really wanted to go that route of letting you be a big daddy. Um, but the story in itself, it held up. It was really good, and um, but it just wasn't as impactful overall across the board for people like the first one was. Um, and yeah. I think a lot of it has to do with that climax being like towards the midpoint of the game, um, but a little bit earlier in a way. So it just kind of really got to you quickly in terms of really turning up the heat. Uh, Bioshock 2 really took a while to really get running. But then again, being a big daddy was awesome, right? The gameplay was yeah. great. You, you felt unstoppable. Um, and you played through it, and there was no problem if you were a fan of the series. Uh, if this was your first time going in, you probably were like, uh, you know, this is cool and all, but I don't have any connection to this universe. So really the first one is pivotal if you really want to enjoy the second one. Um, and then yeah. Infinite just changes the envelope a lot. And it does what people actually wanted a second Bioshock to be like in terms of if they wanted to do something different, go that route, like the Columbia route, because yeah. Infinite is very beloved in terms of the Bioshock series. Yeah, definitely. It's so original and it's, such, it's a very mm -hmm. good story on its own, but it's also the fact that it does fly under the, the Bioshock umbrella, you know, exactly. just adds to it. Mm -hmm. I, I would consider that, even though it's before Bioshock, I would I would have loved for them to maybe have released Bioshock, Bioshock Infinite, and then maybe a Bioshock Two, um, yeah, because like maybe a... it would have changed what Bioshock Two would have been, you know? Yeah, you definitely. Maybe it wouldn't have been focused if Infinite came first. But decisions are in the past, right? And obviously, the franchise is still very successful. And um, Irrational Games and the other developer was who developed Bioshock Two. Uh, Two K Marin. 2K Moran, right? Um, they've both done a great job. We don't know if they're gonna if they're doing if they will do a future one. If Ghost Story Games will do a future one, but um, there are obviously a lot of rumors where it's in development, right? Something's in yeah. development over there. They've been at work at it, you know, for a while, and they will announce when it's ready. Um, and that time seems like it's creeping up. So I figured it was a great time to really dive into Bioshock and dive into the experience that it brought us, and you know what each game really changed and maybe moved forward. But it obviously all ends with Infinite. That's the last glimpse that we got of the Bioshock universe yeah. and um, what the movement and mechanics could really be like. Uh, a lot of heavy influence right now. Obviously, with Deathloop and Arcane Studios, um, there's a lot of influence taken from that Bioshock field. And um, they're obviously doing a killing over there. They're making some great games. Oh, yeah. um, Deathloop oh, yeah. was an amazing game. I still have yet to play it, but the reviews have all been great and I've seen a lot of gameplay. It seems very smooth. And um, before that, they had Dishonored, um, Dishonored 2, and those games each in their own also very great critically acclaimed games. So there's inklings of this type of genre, you know, people who make it all throughout the industry, and we'll see what we get going forward. But I'm definitely excited for what Irrational or actually Ghost Story Games has coming up next and um, seeing where they move forward. Would yeah, me think? too. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. All right, everybody. So this is Film and Gaming Podcast. Thank you guys for joining us again this week. Again, remember, we did reach 1K last week. Huge, huge milestone for me and everybody on here. For us going from the beginning, it's really nice to get to that 1K spot. And we ain't stopping here. Um, if you guys like the content and enjoy, just drop a like, subscribe down below. Let everybody know, and especially us, what you guys think about the Bioshock series and uh, what you may want to see in a future game. Let us know in the comments and then drop a like and we'll see you guys next week. This is Filming Gaming Podcast, guys. Peace out.